everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators, Mind Pe- Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually am really pumped today. Uh, we've rescheduled this because every time we've actually tried to have this, we got lost in conversation and had to reschedule uh, to actually record. So we made sure that this is happening today. But I am so pumped to actually have Dr. Mary Hemphill with me today. Amazing leader. I'm going to talk about, uh, and we're going to talk about her book, One Minute Meeting. It is absolutely fantastic. I love it. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about it, and it's something that I've really been adamant about, is really kind of the focus on placing students at the center of the work that we do. And not just, you know, focusing on, like, working backwards from our students, but really having them in on the conversations, having them have, you know, meaningful ownership over what we do in schools. And this book does that beautifully. And I'm so pumped about it. So actually, before we even start, if you're watching this on YouTube, we would love to hear like some of the ways, especially as schools are opening right now, how are you actually kind of really focusing on how you start with students, how we get students in on the conversation as you're planning for the school year, as you're connecting, um, you know, thinking about what that school year is going to look like. And I know a lot of people are all over the place, whether it's remote, face-to-face. So, you know, we'd love to read some of your comments and we can make this a resource for other people so they can learn. But uh, Mary, thank you so much for being here. I am so pumped to have this conversation. I love all the conversations we've had before this as well. And if you could just kind of tell a little bit about your journey. I know, um, and thank you for doing this because you just got married. You just published a book. You, you're like, you've basically done, like you've owned 2020. And so it's amazing to, to see. But can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your educational yeah. journey that, you know, you want to share with everybody? Absolutely. And thank you so much, George, for having me. I'm so pumped to have this conversation. And because we are in a time where we have to make a shift. All eyes are on education. So I believe if we don't wanna squander this moment that I talk about this in the book that students are the educational heroes that we've been waiting on. And throughout my educational journey, not only as a North Carolina teaching fellow and going to college, but then returning right back to the same school I was a third grade student in, I was able to stand at the front of the classroom and tell my students, I sat in your seats, I I grew up in your community, and I wanna make sure that you have all the tools and resources you need to be successful. But even for my first year teaching, I wanted to go along on that journey with my students. I did not want to be the writer, the owner, the, the, the true, the only facilitator of their journey. And each one of them brought such unique experiences into the classroom. They taught me things along the way. And so this was back in 2005. And so understanding that I really wanted to do education different from the classroom and being able to elevate to an assistant principal and eventually a principal, I just started to notice that we had such adult-centered policies, practices, and pedagogies that, you know, as it being in the room as an assistant principal and watching my principal struggle with challenges with scheduling, challenges with curriculum, challenges with where to put resources, you know, and then having difficult conversations with parents. We were having so many conversations with grown-ups, and we were never going back and asking our students, how does this make you feel? Is this something that you feel is even making an impact on your education? Is there something that we're doing in overabundance, but it's really having very little impact on your overall journey and where you end up? And so when I became a principal of my first school, it was a failing school, and we had 80% free and reduced lunch. And it had been in that same trajectory for over a decade. So they had had a number of principals. They had had a number of uh, different turnover when it came to their teachers. And that's where the one minute meeting began. I went to my superintendent and I said, there is something that has to happen in this building where our students walk in and they understand that they're not failing, where teachers are going to need a culture shift, where they understand that this is not a dumping ground school. And in order to do that, in order to create this change, I want to meet with every student in this building for one minute. And we had 430 students at the time. So I knew that 430 minutes would be a huge investment in our building if I was able to take what the students said and make change happen in our building. And that first iteration of one minute meetings, I asked them three questions. How are you doing today? What's your greatest celebration from the past nine weeks? And what's been your greatest challenge? 
when I tell you it opened my eyes so much to, to really think about the fact that it were the things that those students shared with me had nothing to do with English language art, nothing to do with math, science, or social studies, had nothing to do with the extracurriculars we were offering, and everything to do with who they were as little human beings people who were coming in our building and sharing the best and the most parts of their day with us. When they talked to us about things that were going on in their home, their fears, the things that their parents had talked to them about, bullying that was going on, amazing celebrations that had happened in their life outside of the classroom. And that's where I said, the barriers between what's happening with our students at home and school, we've got to start blurring those lines so they can see themselves in our building. That's how the one minute meeting was born. And it just started to get better over time as we started to take our executive lead team on the journey with us. And, in, and it was amazing because by the end of that first year, teachers were doing the one minute meeting with no mandate for me, no sitting down and saying, I require you to do these one minute meetings. They would give a benchmark quiz and then I would see their little mobile office outside the classroom and I'd go by and I'm like, you know, Miss Pierce, what are you doing today? And she was saying, well, we just had a benchmark. I'm going to do a one minute meeting with every child in my classroom to ask them how they're doing in my class. What was their greatest challenge on this benchmark? Was there something that I did that didn't reach them? And what was their greatest celebration? And we started a culture of true student centered pedagogy and using their voices and being able to take that data and create goals for ourselves and create change, we went from a failing school to almost a B school in two years with 88% growth. And it was because we started with the students. There's like a million things I want to ask you just from okay. the opening of what you said. The, the thing that, I, and I actually wonder when, because the, the book is so amazing because it gives so many incredible strategies, but it's also like, I feel I'm following this narrative of your mm -hmm. progression of like school. And so like when you were actually doing this, like, were you mm -hmm. like, were you like, Hey, this will make a really good book. Like, was it after you saw success? Cause it was really, it's really incredible. I love the, it's like, Hey, cause I think a lot of times we look back at schools, we talk about, you mm -hmm. know, things that worked. But I, I felt like you're, I'm walking through this journey with you and you're connecting and talking about like really meaningful ways, but I'm also watching your school progress. Like it was like a really kind of, you know, I love the way that you connected it, right? Thank and it you. felt so um, real and I feel, to be honest, you so inspirational because the the idea of like how we connect with our students and how we connect with our community and actually showing like this actually really matters in the work that we do. And I don't know um, if you've heard me talk about this before, but I talk about the notion of like, I actually hate the term data driven. Like I hate it. And everything that you're doing is truly learner driven. And if you really know the kids in front of you and you yeah. know who they are, what they struggle with, what their strengths are, I think. And that's, you know, just thinking about how you address those in the three questions, then you can do some really amazing things. But if you only look at numbers and you don't look at people, then you're going to lose out quite a bit. So what was like, what was the process? Like what, what made you decide to not only to write this book, but the way you did it? Because like I said, it's beautiful how the, the narrative, like it's, it's like a, I've, feel like you're telling me a story of your school and then just like, and, and here's how this actually happened. Like it's like, I'm just watching the progression, right? It was, right. It was really well done. I really love it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I think the storytelling part of it was to be transparent and to be mm -hmm. authentic. Because if you notice in the book, I tell you where the book, where the school ended up and it wasn't, we still had work to do even after chapter 15. So as I was thinking about it and living through this book, there was, I was definitely not thinking I would write a book about it. But what I knew was that with 180 days in a school year, you are blessed and highly favored if you get 150 amazing days. And that's with everybody mm. working at their optimal level. That is with no fire drills, no natural occurrences like a hurricane. You know, there's no assemblies that have wasted your entire day. You see what I'm saying? Like you have 150 good days. I knew that if a, there's a school that was failing and 430 of my students at the time, I talk about in the book, when I inherited the school, 22% of my children were reading on grade level. Mm -hmm. 
I was, we were failing a dismal percentage of our children. There was no way that on our shoulders, and when I say our shoulders, I always think about the school improvement team and the leadership team. If we let that sit for 150 days trying to figure out what to do and doing the meeting before the meeting, then the meeting, and then talk about what we're going to do in the next meeting, I cannot, I cannot go to sleep at night knowing we've wasted somebody's time or somebody's one shot at second grade or sixth grade mm -hmm. or 12th grade. So the one minute aspect came from the urgency. We are always talking about an education that we need time, we need time, but what are we doing with our time? Mm -hmm. So when I went to you know, our administrative assistant, our data managers and my assistant principal at the time, I said with 430 students, we have 400 minutes. And in the book, I talk about scheduling the principal. If I was spending more time in my office solving problems instead of going to where I could find solutions, then I knew that I wasn't, you know, really maximizing my mm -hmm. time. So that's where I came up with the mobile office. I said, let me take my office to the students so that I can not only be in the hallway, I could be a part of their conversation, see the flow of what's happening, but also take that one minute to have that conversation. And again, it just evolved. I said, if I could take this one minute, but turn these into tangible goals, turn these into conversations, what teacher, even your most curmudgeon teacher who has been in it for 35 years, they don't have a good outlook on, how can they argue with what the students are telling them versus me coming in as a new leader, passionate, vibrant, wanting to make urgent changes. The only way we were going to move that school as quickly as we did is if we use the voices of our end user. And I say this all the time, the end user is the student. They are the most important client and customer in education. And we have not up until this point engaged them in this conversation as stakeholders. So using their voices that we use their feedback to create our school improvement goals. And again, the ahas that came out of that from teachers who have been in it, struggling so long, using the students' words, it helped move them, it moved mindset, and it did move that letter grade. Well, the, the, the one thing I, I love when you talk about the, 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 like the mobile office, when, when I was a principal, and actually when I worked in central office as well, mm -hmm. we all have laptops, right? right so right. I would just contact a school and say, hey, I'm gonna actually, can I sit in um, like a teacher's uh, classroom for three hours like can I, I'm just gonna uh, sit and so I just pop my laptop and I would do email administrative stuff yeah. and I would tell the teachers hey look I'm not here to evaluate you I'm actually here to evaluate the environments that we put you in because it's really easy to say like why can't you you know why can't you do these incredible things with technology uh, in your school and then you walk in a classroom and you're watching a teacher with an iPad you know trying to get it like trying to find the Wi-Fi signal you know, okay the, okay maybe that's why and, and so like that, that to me was really powerful. And the, the, the one thing, and it, it's, and I don't know, cause a lot of people say, Hey, we can change, you know, if we got this money or we got this and like, nobody thinks in the world that, Hey, education is like totally adequately funded. You know, we know this, but I also believe like, we have a huge power. Like um, I talked about this in Innovates at the Box. Uh, there's actually research done that's showing that social capital, like building relationships, actually has more of an impact on uh, moving schools forward than money. Yeah. And it's not saying that don't, don't adequately fund schools, but I think we have a lot more power um, mm -hmm. in, in actually making change, you know, in kind of shifting. And the, this is actually one of the quotes that really connects with me right at the beginning of your book was when students are positioned, experience, discuss, and analyze their experiences as learners, think holders, and stakeholders. That's, that, I'm going to talk about that word in a second. In the school, change happens from the inside out. So when you're talking about students as stakeholders, this is not even just engagement. This is truly empowerment. Like I actually have ownership over what happens in this school. So how do you, like what are some of the things that you saw of like really engaging kids in those conversations, but then actually started to change, you know, what, what started to change because of what, of what your students' feedback was? 
Right. So I started with the same processes that we go through when we think of adults. So we have done a lot of academic research on how we take teachers from point A to point B. So if people say, let teachers know what you're going to do, communicate with them, create a plan that they can follow, create time and structure so that they can engage in whatever you're giving them, whether it's strategies, professional development, whether it's observation feedback, give them time to be able to implement and then go back and see the change. And in the book I talk about, we literally created and crafted morning announcements and assemblies so that we could talk to our students about how they were going to help us with this process. So we introduced the one minute meeting. We said, we're going to take time to talk with you in your classroom. We're going to come to you. These are the questions we're going to ask. And then this is how you're going to see the change happen. So even with that, after we had the conversations with students, we would go back on the announcements or we would go back to their classrooms and say, here are some changes that you're going to start to see based on what you have shared with us. And we didn't just leave them to their own devices to think about that or to mull over that. We engaged their parents and families into it as well. So there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the conversations with parents and we said, hey, we're going to be asking your children what they think about school and gleaning their feedback. And I had one parent that said, my baby's in kindergarten. What can he mm -hmm. possibly tell you? Children live with no filters, okay? There is no filter in the world that, that can, you can put on a child when it's their truth, right? So we created structures for them to be able to communicate. So I break down in the book, elementary, middle, high school, even exceptional and magnet and alternative schools and how you can arrive at those classrooms so that the students are armed to communicate. So we had smiley face, a sad face, an angry face. And we said if the child was nonverbal or if the child was not ready yet to use that emotional language attached to an actual vocabulary word, we said point. How are you today? Show me where, where, you, where it is that you're feeling. We had different things where we would say, what's your biggest challenge? And so we had adaptive technology because I went straight into with my, um, my exceptional children student on the this end of it was with our students with autism our students with adhd all the way to our academically and intellectually gifted we made it make sense for them so that we were building them up through this process our students started to see changes um, our students started to see that we were approaching learning differently and then when you ask a child in one of the stories i was going around and i was asking the child you know what's your greatest challenge and she said to me it was tommy and I said, what do you, what do you mean, Tommy? What, what is, how is Tommy standing in the way of your learning? She said, Tommy cheats off my paper. Tommy kicks me underneath the desk. Tommy has been sitting beside me in math, distracting me. And I've told the teacher three or four times that Tommy is an issue and he still sits there. After we finished that round of one minute meetings, took that data back, extrapolated it, and took it back to the staff and talked to those teachers. And we moved Tommy to a completely different place in the room. We had a conversation with Tommy. We rallied around Tommy to help him be a better Tommy, but also for that mm -hmm. student to help her be successful. Her grades went up from a 56 in English language arts to almost a B there. But she also saw that we were listening. Mm -hmm. One minute meaning will be nothing if you don't put feet to what happens to those, those children's words. And that's what we did. When they started to see that we were doing that, there was one chapter in the book where the little kindergartner said, Dr. Hempel's back as he's doing that thing where she asked us about school. <laughs> they look forward to it because right. they know this is 60 seconds where my voice matters. And then when I see them at lunch, it's not just, hey, Susie, how are you doing? Hey, Tommy, how are you doing? Hey, Tawanda, how are you doing? It is, hey, remember you shared with me that you were struggling in math. How is that going? You shared with me that you're you're a big brother now. How's your baby sister? She I know she's so grown. You know she's grown now. You're helping your mom. That's relationship. Mm -hmm. That it transcends the academic expectations we put on them while ignoring the other eighty percent of them. And so when you do that, you extend the relationship, you extend the conversation, and you make them human by developing conversation vocabulary and expectation so the the when you said the filter thing like all kids have no filter um, i remember when i was you know working in schools every day 
And mm-hmm. if I had like a big zit, I'm like, well, this is what I'm gonna hear about all day. <laughs> this, is, this is, hey, what's yes. that on your head, Mr. Kuros? What's that on your head? Like, yeah. it's just like, so yeah, I don't know why that's the first thing I thought about, but you're like, right. oh God, this, this kids are gonna bring this up all day. Like, all they're not day long. Negative, what they think is negative. They're just, they're just curious, right? They just, just wanna know. The, 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 um, so when people are listening to this right now, and I, this is, I think, a concern. It's not like you just uh, like scheduled meetings with kids. They never met you before, never yeah. talked with you before, and then you do this <laughs> like this like meeting, and then that's uh-huh. it, right? And I right. think that's what there can be some disconnect here is that to actually be in a space where students trust you to actually yeah. tell you the actual answers, you know, mm-hmm. like something that's meaningful. So like before you get to that space where you start having those meetings, like was there mm-hmm. things that you were doing before to kind of build mm-hmm. those relationships? Like what are some of the things that you saw as crucial to set up that you're getting uh, those answers from that? Cause I know like mm-hmm. after the fact you, you have that trust, you, yeah. you see the meeting, uh, kids actually see actions based on what they share. So mm-hmm. what, what are the things you do before then? So I always liken this process to painting a room. So you have to assess like in the room, what do I want to paint? What do I need to prime? And what, what, what do I want to do when I, what is the finished product? You have to prime. Okay. And by that, I mean, I was always at the front door every single morning greeting students as they came in so that the first voice that they hear from me was not the announcement. And I was just not a voice in a box. Mm -hmm. I was literally Dr. Hemphill, like, oh my gosh, that's her. I just saw her a minute ago. And, and I alternated. I was either at the car riders or was at the bus riders so that I could see all of my students, you know, coming in and asking how they were. I would literally go to the PE classes and I would play kickball. Mm-hmm. Or I would play dodgeball or I would I would engage with them outside of just doing an assembly. And we did the assemblies, we did the cafeteria duty, we did those things, but I engaged with them. Even as you said, when I would go do observations, it wouldn't just be me sitting behind a computer tapping, tapping away. It would be I would go sit on the floor. I would get into the reading circle. Mm-hmm. I would sit outside of their literacy blocks and set, talk to them about what it is they were doing. And not just that. There were other things we did to prime the community. So when you are in a low socioeconomic school, parents are suffering from PTSD because they've had such negative experiences with too many leaders, people weren't listening to them, Mm -hmm. or they've set their um, expectations so low that if you exceed them, they think that it's just going to be a one-time thing. So we actually eliminated parent-teacher conferences where the parents came to the school we partnered with local um, churches, we parkled, partnered with local nonprofit organizations, and we even partnered with the high school. We did parent-teacher conferences in the fellowship hall at some of our biggest churches in the community. Parent Teachers would get their laptops, they'd get their data and everything, and they would sit at big, long tables, and the parents would come in, they'd sign up for a time, and they would be in the fellowship hall. It was a place they were comfortable with. We Mm -hmm. broke down the barriers and it was something different. If they did not feel comfortable coming to us, we went to them. We even did parent and teacher conferences outside the stadium on football Friday night because our community loved football. And so where are they going every Friday? They're going to the football games. That relationship primed us to do the one minute meetings because then, again, kids are listening to everything. So when right. they hear parents have positive conversations at home, did you see that our the your principal and the teachers were at the, the church? Or did you see that your principal and the teachers were at the football game? That primed us up to, to re- be received positively. And again, we had to change that narrative with our teachers as well. We had to, there were some teachers we had to bring along because again, they'd had such negative experiences. Then when you go to them and you say, and now we want to start the one minute meeting, Teachers and parents and students have seen you outside of their comfort zone. They've seen you doing something different and modeling what you expect in terms of conversation, authenticity, and that you want them to be vulnerable because you can't ask children to be vulnerable if you yourself have not modeled vulnerability. And then when you sit down with the kindergartners or 11th graders, they're like, we've seen you everywhere. There's something to this. There's something different about this. Maybe if I take the chance and risk giving you my truth, there'll be some change on the back end. 
And that's the other piece of it. You have to deliver on the truth. Because if the truth is that your students are telling you that your school culture is challenging, your school culture is not built up for them to be successful, yes, you're going to have more work to do, but it's going to be the right work. This is, this uh, actually, this quote really stuck out to me. Uh, Dr. Hempel, your school had no transfer requests for the first time ever. I'm hearing great things about your school. So, of course, no one wants to leave. And I think, I think part of that when you are creating that space where, and I always talk about this, there's a huge difference between uh, being valued versus feeling valued. Mm. Because if you feel, if you like a lot of people, we say like, oh, we totally value all the work educators do, but then Mm -hmm. the actions that, you know, don't necessarily measure that up, but it's really, it's super easy to say. And I think that kids, when you're talking about this, it's really how do you ensure that students feel valued in their process. And if you feel the school is truly ours, that Mm. what I say is acted upon, and probably, I'm sure this is true too, is that there are some things that a kid would say and you're like, you know what, I I appreciate that, but that's actually, you know, to have that honest conversation, like, hey, we can't do that. Like we can't have six hour recess. Like that's not happening, right? And so, you know, because some of that conversation, um, will happen. So since Definitely. since this is so centered on relationship, this is a question I've been asking people lately. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I actually I struggle with the answer. Because I actually think a lot of people I think a lot of people are that are really, I don't I don't want to I don't know the, the terminology I would want to use here, but like, know their stuff inside out, but can't build the relationships. Uh don't do as effectively as someone who's really good with relationships and kind of has like, you know, understanding because that relationship piece is so crucial. So Mm -hmm. when you have someone on your staff, and I'm sure, you know, I'd be surprised if this has never happened, that maybe isn't good at building relationships, Mm -hmm. isn't, you know, knows their stuff inside out, but it doesn't have that relationship piece. Like, what do you, what do you do in that situation? How do you help someone become better at relationships that you're working with? Because it's Absolutely. centered in everything you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It is. Let me, let me tell you what the great leverage point was for those teachers that I had who, when I tell you amazing teachers throughout the course mm-hmm. of my career, who all the degrees, all the certifications, understood the pedagogy inside and out. But then when they landed in front of that classroom and you put them you know, to implement a lesson plan, or you started really talking to the students about what was happening in that classroom, there was such a divide literally using the students feedback was one way that we did that but we also had to change our approach in terms of conversations are what ignited the change not checklists so we have this checklist of what a great teacher does and what a great teacher is able to do but if that checklist cannot transcend into a conversation where you level the playing field. So one thing teachers always used to tell me, particularly the ones that struggled with relationships, was I know so-and-so is doing that down the hall, but is that something I can do with my kids? Well, you know what? Let's set it up so that we can show you how that happens. I would cover that teacher's classroom for 20 or 30 minutes and bring that other teacher in because you're removing the excuses that it can happen with your kids, that it can work with this demographic, and you show them something different. Then you have a conversation after that with no laptop, no pen, no paper, but genuinely come out from behind your desk, sit in a place where it's not a barrier between you versus them. It's not a power struggle and have that conversation with them. Also, when we use the students' words and we said, this is what students are telling us about your learning environment. Tell me what you think about this. Tell me what you see not going into it with the students say that you're terrible at building relationships this is something that needs to change you have judged and then you've put a a condemnation on them and not given them a strategy but when you say tell me what you think about this and what do you see here as an opportunity for improvement there's not a whole lot a teacher can say outside of their need something needs to change but you have to be willing to go on that journey with them Sometimes that journey leads to change. Sometimes that journey leads to a career change. And that's what we need to be okay with because I cannot sacrifice another cohort 
of 20 to potentially 80 children that will come through your doors if you are yourself aren't willing to change. When I haven't, I haven't come down on you. I haven't condemned you. I haven't judged you, but I've given you, like you just said, the data outside of the numbers that says quantitatively and qualitatively, you're not hitting the mark. Right. And I think that's like, I, I think a lot of times that is the conversation that we have to have is as tough as it is because we want, I think a lot of times when an educator is not doing well, they know it too. Right. And yes. you know, that, that's something that, and I would say sometimes when I have some tough conversations with teachers, like, do you, do you really, is it, are you happy? Like, are you mm. happy doing this work? Because if you're not, then maybe we can help you with a, a different phase. And I, I know that's like, people don't want to talk about it. And, you know, it's hard to blog about it because people get defensive, but we want everyone to excel. And sometimes, mm -hmm. and sometimes to be honest, you, some people just need a change of scenery. Like I've actually seen high school teachers go to kindergarten who were yeah. not very good at high school and then just amazing in those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's saying like, maybe it's just a, a, a different fit. Like maybe it's, and sometimes, honestly, sometimes it's a different leader. Maybe I'm not the person to bring out the best in you. And I think those are conversations we have to have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that to me is, it is really good advice because it's actually honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? and, and so right. you could do the one minute meeting with teachers. Yeah. Imagine if you ask them what their biggest challenge or celebration was and to find out, you know, that's a, that's a temperature check on the school culture. Mm -hmm. Totally. Th th so this, um, this actually, you, you talk about just basically leading with people like in the forefront all the time. Mm -hmm. So this, this quote, and you talk, this is from the last chapter, and you talk a lot about productive failure in that process. You say, school leaders have a unique opportunity to shift how school is done by placing students in their rightful place in education at the center, where they belong and where they deserve to be to ensure that school transformation continues long into the 22nd century. And it's like, we're actually at that point where we could actually start talking about the 22nd century, yes. which is like... Right. <laughs> Anyways, so some of us, well, I'm not going to be alive then, but you know, our, some of our kids are. And yeah. I, I think about that. So can you talk a little bit about, there's two things I want to talk, I want you to just address uh -huh. this notion with productive failure and mm -hmm. how you get to that point. But the also, the, how, what does this look like right now as, as people are trying to figure out going into mm -hmm. the school year? And there's so many variations of like, we might be doing this, we might be doing this, there's so much uncertainty, like your work, how does it tie? Actually, what was really interesting about your book, because it, it like just came out and it's, you're talking about pandemic stuff too, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And so yeah. obviously you were like editing it to literally mm -hmm. the week before it felt like mm -hmm. you know, some of the stuff that you're sharing before it came out to share some of those ideas. So talk about first that, that idea of productive failure and what that, why that's so important. It's so important because there are so many things that we do in August that we feel good about, we think it's gonna be great. And then by October, we have seen that it's failing. We've seen we've gotten no traction and we see that the students and teachers haven't bought in. But because in our minds we're locked in for the school year, we keep doing it until May. When we think about the idea of productive failure, we literally put ourselves in perpetual beta. So what we say is we're going to try this in bite-sized chunks. We're going to try this with bite-sized cohorts or groups of teachers and stakeholders and students. And then we're going to see if it works. And we're going to take the best of that experience and we're going to move that on. But what didn't work, we're going to look at ourselves and say, is there a process that needs to change? Is it our mindset that needs to change? Is it a resource that needs to change? So that we don't continue spinning our wheels, wasting energy, wasting people's time, and wasting dollars on something in our building that's not getting us the desired goal. I always uh, use the analogy of, I would rather us bake a whole lot of cupcakes and try those cupcakes out, and if we don't like them, we go back and change the flavor of them until we get it right, versus baking a whole wedding cake because now we have wasted, again, resources, time, energy, and we have to throw that whole wedding cake away. 
when we do that, you are going to find that by August from, from in those 30 days or those good 20 days, you're going to get so much data that you can make September better. Learn from those lessons, set up a culture where that productive failure is accepted and safe, where you can talk about it and glean those lessons learned, but then give people permission to pivot. And to go into the second part of it, if we do not have permission to pivot, if teachers are not allowed to try something different in bite-sized chunks that might move the school, might move their classroom, or just simply make them a better teacher, we're going to lose them because there's so much angst, there's so much fear, there's so many unknowns, executive orders are changing week by week, right. teachers are scared about what's going to happen. Why are we not sitting down with teachers and saying, if you could do it over again, if you could redesign it, what would it look like? And take those ideas and put them into perpetual beta. Try them in your building. If you have a platform, a learning management system that's not working, how, how do you leverage that conversation with your superintendent and say, can you give me this quarter to try this out? Can you find funding for me for me, me to be able to have the permission to pivot right now? Because nobody knows what this education thing is going to look like, particularly when it comes to face-to-face -face or remote or virtual. We, we were trying things. And even since March, look how many times it's changed. Look how many times we've had right. to go back to the drawing board and ask what is going to happen. So set up the culture where you give people permission, but then give, it, give them the opportunity to feel safe in their job security, safe in their voice and safe with bringing their perspective to the table when it doesn't work, because then you're going to start to see that they come back again and again and again and keep trying. And I think as you are sharing this, it really comes back to the beginning of the conversation about being really student centered. And one of the mm -hmm. things like I'm known because I talk obviously innovators mindset about innovation, why it's so crucial, but I'm not against traditional practice. I've never been against right. traditional practice. I'm against bad practice. I'm against yeah. things that don't work for kids. And I think mm -hmm. that conversation is that sometimes as you know, as you were saying at the beginning, being mm -hmm. like a lot of times we're adult centered, people will stick with practices that don't work for kids because right. it, it's comfortable for the adults. But right. if you kind of go through that process of what you're sharing, those little bite-sized chunks, you might actually see some of those traditional practices don't work great. And how do we tweak them? And actually, mm -hmm. how do we innovate the traditional practice? But also yes. I think on the other end too, is that some of the innovative practices, they might not work either. And I think we have to evaluate the process, like what mm -hmm. we deem as innovative. And the reason I talk about, I always talk about innovation has to be new and better. It cannot yeah. just be new. Because I think people will do new practices because um, they're excited about it, but doesn't actually do anything for their kids. And so mm -hmm. I think kind of like always, you know, evaluating, kind of going through that process of innovative teaching and learning, talking about that really yeah. is about being student centered. Like, is this actually of any benefit to our kids? Now, right. can you just, we're, we're close to the end of this podcast, but uh, can you share, and I, I'm going to ask you about this, your, what is your Instagram and what is your Twitter handle? Where can people find you? Absolutely. So my Instagram is the limitless lady. And then on Twitter, I am limitless underscore underscore lady. So you talk about limit. The reason I asked you this, you talked about limitless leadership, mm -hmm. right? You talk about that all the time. Yeah. You see this talking about kind of this limitless mentality. So you've done a lot of stuff in 2020 when 2020 has been really, <laughs> really tough. Right. Uh -huh. and yes. So like, what has led you to really like creating opportunities, embracing like what is like that limitless mentality? Like, can you talk a little bit about that and mm -hmm, why mm -hmm. it's so you know important mm -hmm. at any no matter where we are in in this time yeah. of history? Absolutely. So the limitless leader was literally born from me being a leaderless leader. And when I talk about leadership, I don't just mean in the position and title of being a leader. What I mean is how you lead your own life, how you lead in your organization, your community, your family, your personal life. You are a leader. Having been a leaderless leader, what do I mean by that? I've been the teacher that had those innovative ideas, that knew that the traditional structures were not working, but I did not have a leader, a supervisor, or a mentor who could pour into me and say, not only is it okay that you're thinking this, but here's an avenue and outlet and the permission to be able to move that forward. 
And when you are a leaderless leader, it's almost like a, you're a plant, you're a seed who's been planted. Nobody ever comes back and waters you. Nobody's ever making sure that you have enough sunlight and nobody's making sure that you're in the optimal conditions to grow. I always wanted to make sure that I was never found myself in a leaderless leader position again. Mm -hmm. And even as a principal, you know, I've had amazing leaders, amazing mentors and thought leaders who have poured into me. But when you're a leader who wants to think innovatively, you want to do things innovatively, you have to have somebody ab above you or somebody who can really rally around you and put the structures in place for you to transcend. So the limitless leader truly comes from making sure that we take the limiting beliefs that society puts on you, that sometimes your profession put on you, sometimes that people around you on your personal board of directors, and I mean, that's your cheerleader, your nurturer, your go-to, your advocate, sometimes that they put on you and breaking out of those mentally, breaking out of them professionally, breaking out of them spiritually, so that you can transcend what's happening around you and go to the next level. And I help people do that one-on-one. -on -one. I do group coaching. I've taught to educators across the country about how you can break through those limiting beliefs and create innovative, limitless outcomes for yourself, but also for the communities and people that you've been entrusted to. Leadership is about, I've been entrusted to speak up for children and communities who may not have the language, the resources, or the wherewithal to get out of their current situation. That is a huge responsibility, and I owe it to them to not put limits on what we can do after we experience one another. So I, I'm, I'm listening to you share all this stuff, and I, I don't know if this is like a, a dad thing, but like I'm like, this is the type of person I want to leading my kid's school. And, you know, with my daughters and my daughters are not even, you know, we just are one daughter is two months old and our other daughters, you know, another year. So I, I just, the whole mentality, all the work that you're doing is, is absolutely incredible. And, and really, as you say, limitless, like there's so many opportunities um, that we can create for ourselves in this world today. And I know there's a lot of, you know, um, you know, things that we have to overcome and mm -hmm. that's, you know, part of it, but I just, I, I just, your, your book is amazing. Uh, I'm so glad we have connected and um, had this, these conversations. What is the, what is the best advice? And I'm, I'm actually going to do a one minute time limit just as a theme. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I'm ready. In one minute, what's the best advice you can give to people as they're going into this new school year? In the new school year, make sure that you remember, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. Education has been on the menu for centuries. It is time for us to elevate our voices so that you're in the room when the decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. It is imperative that you're reaching out via email, that you're tweeting, and that you're making the phone calls to those that are at the table. So not only can you get an invitation, but also when they go to that table that they're speaking on your behalf and they're speaking truth. It is time for the policies that are being made that govern education for people to have very real understandings of what's happening in our buildings. And so I, I encourage every educational stakeholder, whether you be the amazing administrative assistants, the custodians, the cafeteria workers who make our schools run and make them what they are, bus drivers, our teachers, our school leaders, our district leaders, our superintendents, that you make sure that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, but this year you may have to build your own table, which means you may have to start your own committees, your own councils, your own virtual town halls. You may have to do that. But those people that you invite, make sure that they represent the cornucopia of people that we have been entrusted to. And don't, for, for, for all intents and purposes, let's not forget to invite our students. I love it, I love it. Mary, thank you so much for uh, taking time. We're recording this on a Saturday because of just scheduling conflicts that we've had and over yeah. conversations that we've had. Um, but I'm going to make sure that we link um, to your book, to your Twitter, to your Instagram, and to your website so people can follow you. Thank you so much for ha having this time with us. I know I feel I'm inspired by just <laughs> having this conversation with you. I know people listening to this are going to feel the same way. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, George, for having me. This has been amazing. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. All right. Bye, everybody.